What if I told you that there was a game that shifted your perspective in a literal and horrific way where the world around you makes absolutely no sense and the only way to describe it is psychedelic even though that term still doesn't fully explain the experience. This game shifts your perspective by way of four different characters you play as, each with their own causes of death, occupations, liabilities, and specialties. Gary will be our first run of the game. After this, we choose a difficulty which will be canon, the way the dev intended the game to be played. The update screen considers this game a horror game with roguelike elements, so you know I'm excited to play this game. The game then describes the other elements of itself, I assume to ease players into this new experience. We must get to layer 444 and defeat the void gods to win, as entities roam the layers between reality and the void, all while attempting to grab any currency or sigils we may find to cast spells, or you can just snatch souls instead. There are many gateways on this map too, so be sure to look out for those as well. We spawn into what looks to be a waiting room of some kind with pure cosmic horror on the outside of us. Here, we can talk to our teammates and team up with them. Now, we can switch between characters on the fly. Gary has blood magic, Minerva has light magic, and both are weak to fire. Even after all of those how to play game screens, the game throws us into an initial tutorial. Teleporters are scattered across the map, meaning that Liminal Void has some non-Euclidean elements as well. When I first loaded into this plane of existence, I immediately did not know how to describe it due to this game having a limited point of reference. I could list off every single item and enemy and functionality to the game, but even if I did that, I feel as if that doesn't fully explain the feeling of this game. It feels like you are trapped outside time and space, as if you are somewhere that feels familiar, but really isn't. This game also just throws a lot of info at you at once, so the learning curve is incredibly steep but I'm willing to go on this journey. Certain doors can be unlocked with certain spells, which means you need specific characters to unlock specific doors, and if you die, you go to a different layer. I finally was able to soul steal, and now I can also be an entity. I could feel a switch flip in my brain, and I was starting to understand the core mechanics of the game. After a certain point, we reached a layer that is very different from the rest, and in this layer, we can add another party member to the squad. But here's the deal, you are not adding to your party, you are replacing a sidekick. Obviously there are various strategies to this game. Like you could die over and over again to get to layer 444, but the more you die, the more you will be punished for it. So ideally finding an exit is really the way to go. 
I got to layer like two, three, three, or something like that, basically halfway. But after declining for a certain member to be on my team, I got stuck in a glitch and had to restart. So in day one, I noticed that there was a lot of blue doors. So I'm going to pick a person who can open blue doors. This means we'll start with Sam Hain. Every single time we load up this game, floor two is the tutorial. But in this specific playthrough, Sam Hain can see sigils through walls. It was at this moment when I realized that the sound design is soul crushing in the most literal sense imaginable, as if you are a virus and these entities are attempting to cleanse you from this very realm. My strategy this time? Grab as many sigils as possible and head straight for the portal, and attack very little enemies, especially since there are some enemies you can't defeat. Now, there is a story, but it's in dialogue chunks that you can choose not to read in these calmer layers of the game. I did read them, but let's go through the characters and the boss of the game before we dissect what is going on with these characters. Generally though, a lot of the dialogue are these characters self monologuing the state of their mental health. There are some layers in this game where you will just die in two seconds because there are so many entities. When I had Gary as a sidekick, I realized that his blood kill is actually super powerful and should be used as much as possible. Each layer has a countdown where you die if you don't find a portal, so essentially this is a speedrun game. Originally I was like, this is not a horror game, and then all of a sudden I found monsters that move when I'm not looking, and then an undamageable entity spawns right in front of me while I'm being surrounded, and that was a terrifying experience. This obviously made me die, and because of that, my sigils reset, which does happen when you die. However, when I didn't die, the relief I felt when I got enough sigils and sprinted to the portal, knowing I was safe. Describing Lara 444 is like spawning directly into a horde where everyone has locked onto you, and if you have no sigils, then you can't attack unless you have attacks that cost zero sigils, but good luck because those basically do absolutely nothing. In the last day, I noticed a lot of purple doors, which means that each run has different colored doors. I wonder if each run was generated in a different order. In my first run, the order was 2, 5, 7, 31, 53, 71, 101, 137, 173, and 191. The second run has different numbers in the sequence, so each run will be unique. The only constants of each run sequence-wise is that the second layer will always be the first floor. You will always run into those calmer segments so that way you can read dialogue, so that is also a constant. And layer 444 will always be at the end, but each journey will have its own unique steps no matter the run. Currently, the soul of the day is Helena, so that will be our main character in this run. Helena can see enemies through walls. Her basic fire attacks, like Blaze It, are so good and don't cost a lot of sigils, and since you need sigils to attack, finding literally every single floppy disk, aka a sigil, can drastically change your strategy. After getting to layer 444, now these two entities spawn in the current layer you are in, purely taunting you, since these are the bosses of the last layer. With every run of this game, you start to understand and learn new things about Liminal Void, like how there are actually sigils in layer 444, so you don't even need to attack a perfect run. I mean, it would definitely help you considering you would have a stronger advantage due to having more sigils, but it's nice to know that all you need to do is just look for sigils. Day 4, the final character, Minerva. She can see layer portals from long distances, which should be useful. And let me tell you, that ability is so incredibly helpful, especially when you're stumbling around in the dark trying to find it. So in this run, I immediately got jump scared as soon as I spawned. Neat. I also ended up on top of a level somehow, even if this wasn't intentional due to the nature of the game, it feels very on brand even still. This time on the final layer, I managed to get one of the bosses down to half health, then all of a sudden he just stopped taking damage. And when I wasn't fighting the boss, either there are layers that have no portals, or the portals were very far from spawn because half the time I still couldn't find them. Day 5 through 8 will be us spending our time getting to know the characters on a deeper level by actually reading all the dialogue because at first glance, it could be a lot to digest if you are someone whose favorite game genre isn't visual novels. While I saw glimpses of this dialogue previously, I didn't pay a whole lot of attention to it at first, but now we will take a dive into the minds of these guys. Gary will be our first case study. His case file paints him as a guy who causes his own death, has an occupation of being essentially a terrorist, who uses blood spells, and has a high visibility to doors and teleporters. Skills include destroying all nearby enemies, destroying doors, and teleporting. A note attached to his file reads, they can snatch and shoot pretty far, plus with the ability to foresee items to travel and the lair, they are best for exploration. 
A little note to keep in mind is that selecting Gary as a main soul will mean that he essentially gets no dialogue since we play as that character, so any story has to come from the side characters, which honestly is a very unique way of storytelling. This means that someone else must be selected as a main soul in order for us to learn more about Gary. Gary is a stressed individual whose priority is protecting others even when it means his own demise, especially due to how depressed he is, yet he considers himself grateful. In the next dialogue session, Gary gives us a little info on the Liminal Layer Society, which were the ones who gave these characters their powers in the first place. He then talks about his powers and has no clue how to kill the Void Gods, these entities who have been mocking us and are in the final layer. A quote that I really liked from Gary was, Keep going forward. You gotta learn even if things get harder. That's just life, man. In the third area, Gary is revealed to have self-esteem issues. A topic of conversation that my own internal dialogue with myself is very familiar with. He then rants about how annoying the doors are to unlock, a topic that any player of this game, not just me, would be very familiar with. Gary is someone with not just self-esteem issues, but trust issues and self-isolation. This is the first time I've related to a character on such a deep level. After each session, the game mentions something about said character, which gives us an even deeper look. Gary is apparently indestructible despite his mental issues. Day 6 will be all about Samhain. He literally has one line about himself and then immediately transitions to talk about the Liminal Layer Society. This shows us how closed off he is from giving out personal info about himself. Samhain speculates the LLS is a cult and can see through their professional act. Samhain had plans to see a lady before he got roped into LLS, cracks a joke at the logistics of if the entities are just jealous husbands, and misses civilization. Side note at this point, it was like the first time I had more than like a thousand sigils without dying and that kind of felt good. I like how the moment I'm on a streak, some entity comes out of nowhere and puts me in my place. Wait, that literally just happened to me. I'm sorry, what? Anyways, Samhain wishes that the entities were hot anime babes. <laughs> wishes for a cheat code to get to layer 444, I mean Sam, implies he knows some secrets that he will only share if we escape, and falls into the trap of toxic masculinity. Another side note is that Minerva's spell that costs 40 sigils is one of the most powerful spells in the game that does so much damage. Day 7 is about Helena, but also, since I'm playing Samhain, Helena makes a comment about how he's a rich boy, which got me thinking, does the dialogue change when you play as a different character? Once we go through all these characters, that will be a question I answer, but for now, Helena obviously has an opposition to rich boys. She hopes that the LLS is not a, um, <laughs> A certain cult. Helena is openly manipulative due to literally confessing to you that she recruited so many victims for the LLS due to her self-proclaimed vulnerable look to lure girls. So now she is my least favorite already. She attempts to backtrack her statement by saying how disgusting it is. So now I don't dislike her as much now because she knows how wrong that is. Helena acknowledges the difference between her and Sam Hain's origins and generally makes some pretty aggressive statements, especially since the game literally describes her as one that asserts dominance. So if you're wondering why this warning appears on screen, it's because of Helena, because no other character is this way in this game. In the next section, Helena describes that in this realm, appetite is no longer a feeling, implies that she feels like we are no longer in our original bodies, as well as feeling like a test subject with false memories. Side note number 107, but it feels so demotivating when you have thousands of sigils only to die by an entity that you literally don't see. I found like a huge haul of sigils in like this specific layer and I couldn't help myself but try to get all of them that I passed multiple portals because I knew that in order to beat the bosses you needed so many sigils. Maybe I ran out of time which caused my demise but I didn't notice the time at all honestly. Anyways Helena says how great money is to wash your problems away, saying, Sanctity is propaganda to keep us confused and miserable so we can keep buying products, is a lovesick person who matches the energy of others, is prone to unforgiveness, and I guess that's all for now about Helena because the game glitched again and now I'm stuck in a wall. Day 8 is Minerva time. She is taken. 
sort of. And that is literally the first thing we learn about her. She has a boyfriend who doesn't have powers in this layer, which brings up the idea that it is possible to exist in these layers without powers. Minerva has a Romeo slash Juliet complex of, spoilers for a 400 year old story, but she killed herself to be with her lover. This lovesick individual is looking for him. And I'm starting to wonder who he is. Day 9 will also be about Minerva actually because I wrote the previous entry at 1 in the morning which made me realize a very specific factor about this game. It is in the horror category which at first I wasn't entirely sure about but if you even try to play this game at night it is a completely different experience. It honestly made me paranoid to the point where I found myself looking over my shoulder while playing and not even during combat but dialogue. There was just an eerie vibe this game gives off and it's a vibe I was not expecting to even notice. Side note, while trying to get footage for Minerva's story, my advice to you if you're playing a Samhain, if you see a portal, immediately go for it. Do not go dilly dallying trying to collect every sigil. Although it is tempting, I promise you 9 out of 10 times you will end up dying and losing all your collected sigils if you don't leave through the portal as soon as possible. The sigils in a way are its own inanimate object trap in a sense when they become visible to you. Because then they become a sort of waypoint that leads in literally every direction so it's very easy to just stumble upon enemies just for a chance at that sweet loot. Minerva is actually hard to spot at all in the second dialogue area, which in my opinion implies that her priorities are not with the other agents, but with her boyfriend instead. Literally nobody in this game likes rich kids, because fair enough, and Minerva makes it very obvious that she is a rebel without consequences. She's just a silly little girl who loves the team's diversity. Although her actions say otherwise. Also, maybe I'm an idiot, but I swear this is the third time I've gotten stuck in this freaking wall. Day 10. Surprisingly enough, there actually is another character. Sort of. LLS is a cat looking droid who is at every dialogue checkpoint. While not a playable character, it still gives us more insight to the world, despite on the surface just seeming like a self insert tutorial droid. Once you talk to it, you cannot replay the dialogue, so paying attention to its words feels a lot more important than the actual playable characters. It exclaims that we are back to life, that we will meet again in layer 097, and then all of a sudden pauses as if it's expecting you to exit dialogue, but you're still here. It then states that it cannot answer questions regarding the society that this experiment is a test of spellcasting abilities, and that defeating the Void Gods will lead to a full membership into the LLS. On layer 097, it gives us a very important note. It warns us that going into certain layers may mean that an exit might not be available, which was a theory I had earlier, and reminds us that F can be used as a special skill if we feel trapped at all, an ability I honestly haven't used this entire time, so I tried it and it instantly killed me, but at least now I know it's an option with every character. In the next dialogue layer, it has a communication error warning us that the void gods are almost there. It also starts fritzing out by censoring certain words. All we know for sure is that this is layer 223, and we lost contact. Day 11 moves into action and contains special moves. As far as my knowledge goes, you must select a specific soul at the beginning to use special powers. Also, this is another point in the game where the seizure warning makes sense, so just wanted to throw that out there. Gary destroys all nearby enemies by throwing shards of red beams in a defensive aura. Samhain pushes them back with blue aura of what appears to be lightning. Minerva uses thorn-like substances to inflict pain. Helena erupts in pure power as blinding light overwhelms the plane she currently resides. After taking a look at every character, I wanted to investigate further. Are these characters dynamic in the sense of if depending on which character you choose, will there be different dialogue per person? In order to test this theory, we will talk to the same person with three different characters. We will talk to Gary for this experiment. As Sam Hain, we learn that he apologizes for his abrupt murder and Gary died protecting the secrets of others. Talking as Helena, there is in fact new dialogue. Gary states how he doesn't know much about the organization and asks if we know fire spells. As Minerva, Gary said they both took their own life and that Gary does know what happens when we kill the Void Gods. The fact that each character has not only so much dialogue to read, but depending on which soul you select at the beginning of a run, you will get different dialogue by the same person you are talking to. This is incredibly impressive and makes the game very replayable, not just from a gameplay perspective, but a story perspective too. 
while yes, it always leads you to the same boss, every journey in this game is wholly unique, meaning every player will have a genuinely different experience, which is very hard to pull off successfully. Each of these interactions has a different number of dialogue boxes, so not only are the conversations different, but they vary in length as well. Gary, in the first area, has 32 pieces of dialogue in total. And since there are four of these dialogue areas, we can assume that Gary has about 128 lines of dialogue in the game. This number isn't exact, but it's a good estimate. Now, if we multiply that by the number of characters, four, we get 512 lines of dialogue. However, if we also include the droid, which has 11 boxes in the first area, eight in area two, and 12 in his final appearance, this is a little bit more manageable to actually count, so this is a more accurate number of 33 dialogue boxes since the droid's dialogue doesn't change. So that gives us with the number of 545, or roughly over 500 lines of dialogue, just to give you an idea of how choosing your character and choosing who you talk to really changes the perspectives you encounter. If you love games about mental health, identity, chaos, and a generally unsettling vibe, then definitely check out Liminal Void.